Hello and a good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening to you, the good people of the tube. Hope you're today, hope you're feeling grand, and all is well in your world. There's a bee outside the window just over there, and he keeps going and banging into it, and banging into it, and just go somewhere else. Anyway, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the Q&A Wednesday, and welcome to, welcome to, why not, welcome to question one. Do you know where you are? You are in Q&A Wednesday. That was my attempt at really, really bad Axl Rose. Terrible. Anyway, uh, question one is difficult to answer. And this question gets asked a lot. And in all fairness, I don't really know how to, I'm going to answer it. So I'm going to just throw myself in the deep end and speak and see what happens. Just the glasses. Okay, so question one is, how would you break down or study my, me, my own style of playing uh, in a similar manner to how you did John Fashanti, Rory Gallagher, and Peter Green. And what makes your guitar playing you? And then if you do this and that and... Like that and... And then also like that. It's like, like, yeah, like that, that and... Yeah, uh, I have no idea. I really don't. Um, people ask this all the time. It's like, oh, can you do lessons on how to play? I was like, I don't know what I do. <clears throat> um, I honestly don't. It's it's really difficult for me to actually explain this because um, I don't know how. I honest, honestly, I really don't know how. Um, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a story. Uh, when I was at the institute in London. Um, one of my tutors got the chance to interview Gary Moore uh, for a, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know what it was for, so I'm guessing it was a guitar magazine or something, I don't really remember. Anyway, he got in, he got to in, interview Gary Moore, and Gary, he was talking to Gary Moore about kind of like, you know, this, that, and the other. And he said to him, oh, would you ever come to the Institute and do a masterclass thing? Because uh, while I was at the Institute, they had a couple of masterclasses. Uh, my brother got to see uh, Bill, like, like Billy Sheehan, like Steve Vai had come and done one at some point, but that was, bef that was either before or after I was there. They, they had quite a lot of really well-known, awesome guitarists coming in and doing like master classes. And um, the, my tutor at the time, he, he asked Gary Moore, he said, oh, would you come in and do a, do a master class? You know, people would love to hear you talk about how you do, uh, how, what you do and how you do it. And Gary Moore's words included swear words, which I won't include, because I can remember this so clearly. He said, I'm not, in doing that, uh, I'm too scared to do that because I don't know what I do. <laughs> he says, I just play the guitar. I don't I don't understand what I do, he says. I just I just play the guitar. And that's kind of where I'm at with this with this whole thing of people asking me like, oh can you do like some videos on how to play like like me? And I'm like, well, I don't know what I do. <clears throat> I don't analyze it. You know what I mean? I I don't I don't even know how to. I have tried I have tried to kind of, I've sat there and I've really kind of gone, right, okay, so what am I doing? And I just don't know. And I honestly don't know. I am totally lost. So, um, what makes my guitar playing me? I uh, want to be John, Fr well, failing to be John Frusciante, I suppose, um, and failing to be Jimi Hendrix and failing to be Peter Green and, and Mike McCready and Rory Gallagher and stuff like that. It's it's failing to be them. Yeah, that's, that that's it. I mean, that... It's that John Mayer line, you know, you, you sound like yourself when you fail to sound like your heroes. And I, I totally agree with that, really, to be honest with you, because I don't really know what I do, other than, other than like, you know, um, pentatonics, uh, which, is, which is all I know. I don't know modes. I don't know stuff like that. I don't understand it. I never have been able to understand it. And I... I, I I don't want to blame anything for that. It's not me being lazy. I tried to understand modes and I got close. I did get close a few times, but it's difficult for me. It, that kind of information doesn't process very well in my brain because of one thing or another. I, you know, I'm, I'm dyslexic and I've got other things as well. Um, so I cut. I the way my brain processes information is not. It doesn't see things simply. Thing, you know, things that may be simple are really difficult, and and things that are, are are complex are even more difficult. If that makes sense. 
And I've never understood modes. I could never get my head around them at all as a smudge on these glasses. It's driving me insane. So I could never, I could never understand that kind of thing. This is why I just, uh, when I was in London at the Institute again, like I say, I remember trying to understand modes and I sat there for hours and hours and hours on end trying to, trying to just get it in my head. And I got my brother to try and explain it to me. That helped because uh, he could show me. Uh, my brother's like a theory whiz. He just he just understands things. I've, I've never been that way. Because I can't get it. It doesn't work for me. So, and and because of kind of like what I learned myself, because I'm a self-taught guitarist, because of what I learned myself, I'm, just com- I'm more comfortable with that than trying to do something that I failed at so many times. You know what I mean? And through failing at trying to understand modes and the more technical aspect of guitar, it led me down the line of, I don't actually want to do that anyway. You know, it, it drew into sharp focus that like I wasn't ever going to be a theory whiz kid on guitar, you know, and I didn't want to be. I really didn't want to be. And I felt not long after I started diving into theory really heavily that, it was taking my creativity away. And that doesn't happen for everyone, but it happened for me. And there's quite a lot of people, uh, Jerry Control's one of them, I can think of as an example, who said, like, diving in too far into that thing took, started to take his creativity away of, of what he could do and what he couldn't do because he started to overanalyze. And I started to do that as well. I started to overanalyze what I was doing. Instead of just kind of like going with the flow, if you, if, if, if you want to call it that, I was starting to go, oh, well, I can't do this because of this. And, and I, 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 oh, I could maybe do this. And just overcomplicating things. And it didn't need to be that way. And there was just a few more issues than... Um, there was far too many issues kind of thrown up with that thing. I didn't like it. And I didn't like the way it was making me feel. It was kind of actually, in all fairness, uh, learning, diving too heavily into theory for me, it was actually starting to kill my enjoyment for playing. So I literally just left it in the dust and decided uh, it's not for me, you know. Um, again, it's the whole thing of like, music will tell you what it wants from you. And it was telling me, this isn't for you, Dave. Forget it. Forget modes. Forget all that kind of really understanding theory. You know your pentatonics. You know up and down the neck. And you know what notes work in every key. You can play in any key. That's all that matters. You know, forget the rest. And it was that point I was like, yeah, you know what, forget it. And I've, I've never looked into theory again since. Um, so that's 2008. So I, And again, it's because I was happy where I was. I had learned enough for me to play like I wanted to play. And I just then, all, from that point on, all I wanted to do was work on feel and expression. And that to me was so much more important than um, understanding a super Locrian mode or understanding modes in general, or or kind of like doing all these pitch axis stuff and all the, and all, or eight finger tapping or, or this, that and the other, or sweep picking or whatever. I wasn't interested at that point. I just wanted to be able to kind of, at that point, my, my brain shifted and I was like, I just want to be able to, um, people to feel what, I, what I'm playing. You know, I just, I just want people to kind of uh, be able to, understand and react and feel what I'm trying to play instead of just kind of going that's a pretty nice flat five you put in there it's a good color tone it's a good color tone I like it over that flat five major seven chord mm. I'm not interested in that it doesn't bother me I am pentatonic guy I like my five pieces of pentatonic scale I've got these extra added notes that add a bit more melody and a bit more kind of value of I feel to kind of where in, instead of just kind of like just stock pentatonics and, uh, and I'm not interested in any of that. So when it comes down to kind of breaking down my style and studying my own playing, I don't do it. I have never have. And I have tried recently. For the last two years, there have been times where I'm like, right, I'm going to sit down and I'm really going to try and understand what I do so I can help, you know, these people who want to understand how I do it. And I just draw a blank every time. It's just like, me. it's just nothing there. There's nothing there. So what makes my guitar playing me? Like I say, failing to sound like my heroes. That's exactly what it. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to sound like John Frusciante and Jimi Hendrix and 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 Mike McCready and, and Roy Gallagher and and um, and Peter Green and Paul Kossoff, you know, and all these other guys. I'm, I'm, and I'm failing at it. And that's what. And that's fine. You know what I mean? 
Uh, because in failing, I'm just smashing all these people together into one big gloop, which makes... I, I don't personally feel like I have my own style of playing. I just, you know, I can hear... Oh, that sounds like Peter Green. Oh, that sounds like John Fashanti, mainly, most of the time. Uh, oh, that sounds like Jimi Hendrix. Oh, that sounds like, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? You can hear all these influences. And, and every now and again, I'm like, oh, that sounds like... Justin Hawkins from The Darkness, or, you know what I mean? There's these little influences here and there. It's like, oh, that was a Danny Kerwin bend. You know, and that's what I like mainly about kind of, like, not analysing things, is every now and again, you know, just things creep in, and I like that more. But as, can I break down my own style of playing to a similar manner, which I did the John, John stuff or whatever? It's like, nope, <laughs> I really can't. Um, somebody, would, somebody would have to do that for me. Uh, which would be very flattering, I've got to say, for, so for somebody to actually kind of break down my style of playing, which I don't really feel is is it's just a cross between my heroes. You know what I mean? It would be very yeah, it'd be very flattering, but I it, I can't do it. I really can't. I, I, you know, and I I, I I I've had a I've had a bit of grief of it in the past. People saying like you know, oh well, you know, if you can't understand your own playing. You're pretty useless. Uh, troll comments, basically, which get the deletement treatment more, more often than not. Um, one guy, really, one guy, a couple of, well, a couple of months ago, really got a bee in his bonnet when I couldn't describe what I do on the guitar. He was like, "Well, if you can't describe what you do on guitar, maybe you shouldn't be even playing." And I was just like, "Tell that to Gary Moore. You get a punch in the face." Or a Les Paul around the head. I don't think Gary Moore would take too kindly to that kind of statement. You know, and there's quite a lot of guitarists out there who are like, I don't know what I do, I'll just do it. You know, um, I don't understand it. And that's fine. And I've never felt like I want to, either. Um, maybe one day I will. Maybe I wonder, I'll be like, oh, I wonder what, how am I doing that? But at this point in time, I am not interested in the slightest bit of trying to analyze or understand particularly what I do on the guitar because I can't do it and it's just a stress to try like I really stressed myself out trying to get it and I was just like this isn't working Dave this just isn't working and um so I, I, I don't know how I would well I can't I can't it's just it's as simple as that so if to do it, somebody else have to do it, if that makes any sense whatsoever, which it probably doesn't. But, like, I don't actually... I don't actually know what I do. Other than Pentatonic, John Fashanti, Jimi Hendrix, Rory Gallagher, kind of Peter Greeny stuff. Uh, Dave Gilmore as well. He's... Dave Gilmore's kind of like... Dave Gilmore's one of those massive influences on me that I never knew was a massive influence on me. Because he's, he's appeared so much in my playing. I, you can hear him every now and again. I'm like... There's Dave Gilmore again, you know, and he's kind of like snuck in the back door, so to say, but he he, he is there. So, yeah, Dave, Dave, I think, is a massive influence on me. I just didn't realise it, you know. And again, this comes down, I just don't analyse it. I just play the guitar, which is all I want to do anyway. I don't, I don't like to sit down and analyse anything. It's why in the morning I can come up with an idea for a song and by six, seven o'clock that night, I'll release it. Because I don't like to overanalyze it. I just want to write it, record it, mix it as best I can with my limited knowledge of mixing and my li my limited ability of, of being able to mix with the, the equipment I've got. I don't want to kick it out into the world because then it's out in the world and there's nothing I can do about it. Because uh, I invariably never listen to my songs again. Once once I've recorded them and released them, I never, re I never listen to them again. Um, and there's only four or five of the 50 something odd songs that I've written since like October time that I can actually remember how to play and I can't remember all of it because I mean if I went back and relearn it if, say if I had a, if I had to do a gig and people wanted to hear like those songs I could relearn them definitely but at this point in time it's like I don't remember how to play most of them I don't even remember how to play the one I released recently apart from the tapping bit at the end uh I don't remember what the other bit was I honestly don't remember I've got it you know, I don't have them written down, but I could just figure it out. You know what I mean? It's, it's that kind of thing. Um, somebody asked how to play... I did a live stream on Instagram the other day. And somebody asked how to play the song Monsters that I wrote. And all I know is it's in C standard on this guitar. So, um, and I, I know the verse. 
which is kind of like a, a very kind of like you know simple chord progression but i don't remember much else about it to be honest with you i know there's riffs in there but i don't remember them because i don't overanalyze i just I, I just submit myself to to music just like i let music take it take me do what it needs to and then just get it out and i don't overanalyze and i learned that from devon townsend last year and i'd always kind of done that but 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 devon townsend's kind of like thing of like you know you you're always going to be able to mix a song better you're always going to be able to make that song better you're always going to be able to write better lyrics you're always going to be able to do this that, and the other but at that point in time you can't and there's no point trying sometimes you might as well just get it to a point where you go yeah that's pretty good and kick it out into the world because if you don't you'll never do anything you'll never release anything because you'll just be like oh no i can do it better i'll do it i'll do it better tomorrow tomorrow will come and you're like yeah it's still okay but i'll do it again tomorrow and then then you get into this kind of sorry about that one i get a bit of memory card glitch again da -da -da -da. Oh, i don't know i don't understand why it does that but i don't know maybe it's the memory card i don't know maybe it's the camera i don't know does it um, does, I mean, does it every now and again though? It doesn't do it all the time, man, but it is really frustrating when it does that. Anyway, especially because it disrupts my f brain flow as well. So what was I talking about? Uh, songs not been finished. Yeah, um, I don't like the idea of kind of like that kind of, that, that brain pattern of, oh, this, yeah, oh I, can, I can do better tomorrow. Uh, there's a story I heard, Chas Chandler was telling a story about Jimi Hendrix. They were recording Gypsy Eyes. Um, was it Gypsy Eyes? Yeah, it was Gypsy Eyes. I think, yeah, I'm pretty positive it was Gypsy Eyes. Anyway, they did like something like 54 takes of Gypsy Eyes because Jimmy was like, no, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's not right. It's not right. It's not right. And they did like 54 takes of this song. And eventually they used the first take because it was the best one. And it just goes to show that, yeah, sometimes the first take might have mistakes. It might have discrepancies in, in sound and it might not be mixed perfectly. But it captures that thing. You know what I mean? And I, and that's why I like to be able to write... I don't like to go back to songs normally. I really don't like to go back. I like to be able to record a song, mix it to a point where I'm like, right, you can hear everything. That's the only... That is... I, I, I'm, I'm rubbish at mixing music. I'm, I'm no good at it whatsoever. But all I look for when I do a mix is that you can hear everything. Nothing's... Well, apart from something that needs to be louder than other things, you know what I mean? As long as you can hear everything and all these little subtle bits in the background, I'm a happy little bunny. So that's all that matters to me when I mix because I'm not... My friend Ian is just like the master. He is like what... The way Ian's music sound has such a depth to it. And it's like, that's what I aspire to be. But I haven't had the experience he's had yet with that kind of thing. And I don't have the equipment he's got to be able to achieve that. You know what I mean? I, I have... I have little studio lab speakers, which are about this big, which I mix on. They're, they're only about, you know, a, what, an eight inch speaker, six inch speaker. Uh, they are full range and I do have a little subwoofer as well. So I can hear bass and I can hear kind of lows and the highs, but I don't have actual studio monitors, um, you know, and, and I have very limited knowledge on, well, I, I have a little bit more knowledge now on mixing, but I have very, still very limited knowledge. But that beside the point of, again, it comes back down to that whole thing of like, how do I play guitar? I don't think about it. I just do it. And the same thing goes when I record a song. I don't think about it. I just let what happen happen. And the same thing with a mix. It's like people say, oh, it could, it could do a better mix. Yeah, I don't doubt. But the fact of the matter is, it is what it is at this point in time. You, you can look at any, look at uh, Iron Maiden. They hate the sound of their first album. Finn Lizzy hate the sound of Jailbreak. Scott Gorham, Scott Gorham despises the sound of Jailbreak. He said it sounds like it's recorded in a bathtub. You know, he said it's rubbish. He said it's absolutely rubbish. The mix and the way it sounds is terrible. But it's a classic album. So, you know, at some point you have to kind of ditch that kind of like, you know, that pursuit of perfection and just kind of like settle and go, that's as good as it can be right now with what I have and what I can do. And that's... and and. That's kind of where I was with guitar, to be honest with you. When I was in London, that's when I decided to kind of like be more of a... I wanted to be a field player. I didn't want to be a theory-based player. Was I've reached the limit of what I can learn and what I'm good at. And from this point on, I'm just going to play out of field because that's what I want to do anyway. So when it comes down to breaking down my style and, and, and being able to teach how I play, I can't do it because I don't think about it. And I have tried and I fail at it every time. And it just winds me up and frustrates me because I can't do it. 
So I do, I do apologize for that, but how do I do it? I don't know. I don't think about what I do. I just play this piece of wood with wires on it and I love it, you know, and, I, and because I love it so much, I don't want to analyze it and I don't want to particularly know what I do. I just want to do it and I just want to play the guitar. You know, I mean, I don't want to have to think about what scale. Of, I mean, the only thing I think about when I when I solo is, okay, what key am I in? Okay, I'm in G minor. Okay, away I go. I don't think at that point. I don't need to think at that point because I know where I can go and what I can do. And depending on what guitar I'm playing, what I'm capable of doing, because certain guitars will give you ability to do certain things that others won't. So if I've got a Strat, I know what I can do on a Strat. If I've got a Les Paul, I know what I can do on a Les Paul. An acoustic, I know what I can do on acoustic and so on and so forth. But I don't overanalyze it. I just, I just know. You know what I mean. I, I just know what I, I know what I need to do. And, and and fundamentally, it comes down to kind of now. It's kind of like you know. I just, I, I kind of, I want it to say something. But anyway, I'm going to move on because I could talk about that for hours and I and I will if I'm not careful. So, but yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I know that's a pathetically bad answer, and I do apologize for that. But I honestly don't know what I do. I really don't. You know, I, I struggle. I struggle to understand what I do if I try and sit down on uh, try and try and figure it out. So I'll just do it. You know, um, it's all pentatonics. That's all I can tell you. You know, that is literally it. I don't, I don't do anything else really. You know, there's the odd harmonic minory bit, but that's about it. But I don't really understand that to be honest with you. I don't understand the theory behind it. I know when to use it and when not to, but I don't understand it. You know what I mean? It's like if you have to, if you, if you're after a. Uh, a definition on how to use it and when to use it. I, was like, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I just kind of feel when I need to use it. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, so I've got to move on to question two now. So I, I know that's not the best answer, but it's the only one I've got. So I hope I hope there's, there's something in there. So I do apologize. So uh, move, moving on to question two now. Question two is, uh, could you do a lesson on a Jimi Hendrix song, Voodoo Child? Uh, the blues one, not Voodoo Child, Slight Return. No. <laughs> I wish I could, because it's one of my favourite, favourite Jimmy songs of all time. And I think it's one of the best blues songs ever. Uh, with Steve Winwood on, on the Hammond organ and the way Jimmy and him play off each other and, and Jack Cassidy on bass and, and Mitch on the drums. It's just like, oh. It's just, it's just dark blues heaven. And Jimmy's guitar tone is to die for in that song. It's just the most gorgeous blues guitar tone I think I've ever heard in my life. I think it's my favourite blues guitar tone in Voodoo Child. Uh, it's just heaven, heaven. Um, but can I do a lesson on it? Sadly not, because... not Well, not on YouTube anyway, because the Hendrix Estate would have something to say about that. Because they are absolute... Swear words. Um, they don't like anything... <sighs> Saying that people still get away with doing covers of Jimmy, but I can't. I try and teach his songs and, and try and prolong his memory, but I, I'm not allowed to do that. But people are allowed to do covers of it. And it's like, okay, that makes sense. Cheers. Um, I don't get it. I don't get it. I remember when um, Mark Agnesi got banned at Norman's Rare Guitars for playing Jimi Hendrix stuff. And it's like, oh my God. Janie Hendrix needs to get a life. I don't, I don't appreciate the Hendrix estate. And I don't think Jimmy would have appreciate the Hendrix estate, if I'm being perfectly honest. I think um, a lot of stuff that's been released, he wouldn't want released. Uh, I love it, personally, because I'm a Hendrix fanatic, so I, I just anything anything that comes out, I'll listen to. I'm more than happy to. I love it. Um, but Jimmy won't most, won't, won't most of that released because it wasn't finished, and he wouldn't want, it, he wouldn't want people to hear it. Uh, Jimmy wouldn't... I don't think Jimmy would appreciate... No, other people not being allowed to play his music because that's how Jimmy wasn't stupid he knew that's how it kind of lives forever the same with people like Jeff Buckley and Je somebody asked, somebody asked Jeff Buckley in an, in an interview once where it was like how do you want to be remembered he says I don't have to be remembered he said all that matters is my music's remembered and it's, it's exactly it and if you can't and Rick Beato talks about this and he's you know what makes this song great thing if you can't if we can't say and we can't play these songs and why we love them and, and, and do that kind of thing and show our kind of appreciation for this that music will die it will die because there's no one keeping it alive you know it's on the life support as it is you know copyright infringement is just pulling the plug you know you, you know led zeppelin you can forget it if you're gonna you know if you think led zeppelin will be remembered in like a couple you know 50 odd years 
if they just keep blocking everybody and their music just keeps going dit, 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 and dying, you can forget it. Same thing with um, other blockers like Fleetwood Mac, you know, and all these other artists who block like, you know, videos like Rick Beato's, which are some of my favorite videos ever created on YouTube, that what makes this song great stuff. You know, if you keep blocking those things, your music will die because no one, no new people will be able to hear it and understand why it's so um, awesome. You know, if you keep blocking it, you might as well forget it. You know, what's the point? Let everyone enjoy it. Especially if you've made your millions. I have a real problem with millionaires going, oh, you can't play that without uh, paying me for it. I'm like, you're a multimillionaire. Grow, uh, grow up. You know, especially companies like Warner Brothers. You know, they're multi-millionaire companies. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'd be surprised if anybody in that company isn't like, you know, apart from obviously the low level people isn't millionaires you know what i mean the people who own that company are, are multi-millionaires you know they'll their their children's 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 children will still not have to worry about money yet they're like oh no 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 we can't let you publish that music that 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 song in that youtube video where you'll earn about a quid if you get thousands of views on it we, we need we need we need at least 90p of that what for you can't even go to the shop anymore and buy 90p sweets. What is that going to do? It's just greed. It's just greed and money-hungry morons ruining it for everybody else. But saying that, some people get away with it, and I don't understand how, and it drives me mad. So I want to show my appreciation for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, John Fashanti, Jimi Hendrix, Rory Gallagher, uh, Peter Green, um, you know... Dave Gilmore and all these people and I'm not allowed because your record company won't allow me to show show uh, won't allow me to show how much I love your music and, and, and show it to, to new people and, and explain why makes about as much sense as punching yourself in the face on a regular basis you know what I mean it, it's just it's stupid it's absolutely ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous I don't get it. It's just it's just greed, isn't it? It's just money. It's like no, you can't possibly do that. You need to pay us to 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 play that song. No, no, no. You've got to pay us to play that song. With what you've took all the money that I was going to earn from it, you know. But I need to survive. Get in the bin. Get in the bin. Anyway, enough of my rant and raving about kind of companies and how greedy they are, especially in this day and age. It's only like three major labels and are all millionaires and they don't need the bloody pence they get you know that youtubers earn they really don't it should be dropped it should just be abolished it's stupid you should be allowed to play whatever you want and you should be allowed to talk about whatever you want it's stupid absolutely stupid it's like that you know some of those copyright like uh, paul david's got copyright flagged for that one chord and and somebody else got copyright flagged for whistling or humming the tune to smoke on the water. It's like, oh my God, come on. Get a life. So yeah, can I do a lesson on Jim Hendrix's Voodoo Child? I can, but it'll have to be on Instagram. And even then, you can get blocked on Instagram now. Why not just say, forget it, music? <sighs> Don't get it. Don't get it. Stupidity reigns supreme. The music industry has never been particularly very clever, but it was. It used to be better. It did used to be better, and you know, I you know my friend Ian who was in it back in the day, he said he feels really sorry for my generation and generations coming up. He says because you will never have the opportunities he had to go on these big tours and 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 do stadium gigs and stuff like that and actually mature and grow as an artist you don't get those opportunities anymore because it's all about how much can we make off you oh i see we made two million off you this year last year but we only made 1.5 million off this year yeah you, you dropped you know because we've got this person over here who's just made three million for us so you're no longer you, you're no longer you know uh, what you've got new songs i don't care i don't give, that's not that yeah that could be a hit but it's not going to be a hit it's not with us actually Give us that song and you go away and we'll give that, yeah, yeah, that song will work really nice over here. So you, you go away and we'll give your song that you wrote that was, shows your development as an artist. I'm going to give it to this person over here. That happens all the time these days. 
it always did happen. Uh, Prince spoke about it. Prince was dead cagey and and, and protective over his music because songs would always get stolen from him. You know, nothing compares to you. Uh, there was quite a lot of songs that were stolen from him and he didn't like it. It really upset him. Hence, he got really funny with his copyright thing. And to a point, I can understand that. But at the same time, you know, as long as they pay tribute to you and say, oh, this isn't my song, it was written by this guy, I can, you know, why not? I understand why he got that funny about it, but I think he got a bit too funny about it. But that's me, you know, I can, I can understand it, but um, I don't get it, if that makes any sense. Like, if somebody said, oh, can I cover one of your songs, and they made it bigger than I ever would, which is very, very possible, because, you know, whatever. Um, not that, no, I know any of my songs are good enough, but anyway, um, like, I wouldn't, you know, I'm going to like, yeah, go for it. Go for it. You know, as long as you credit me in it as I, you know, as I wrote that originally, you know, that that's 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 all that matters, isn't it, really? It's like, you know, there's, there's so many songs, like, you know, Hey Joe by Jimmy, you know, Jimmy's first single isn't his song, it's Billy Roberts, and it was always credited to Billy Roberts. Uh, all on the Watchtower was always credited to uh, Bob Dylan, you know. Um, and that's the point, you know, that's the point. You know, you always get these songs, I mean, Half the Michael Jackson's back catalogue is 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 isn't necessarily uh, titled as written and written and done by Michael Jackson. It's got a uh, you know, there's Quincy Jones. There's I can't remember his name who wrote it. Uh, thriller. Uh, Rod Templeton, or is that Elton John's songwriter? Rod Templeton, or is that his name? Oh, I can't remember. Hang on, I'm gonna look it up while I'm talking. But um, yeah, I mean. You know, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, as long as you give credit where credit's due, that, that, surely that should be enough. Um, doo -doo -doo. Rod Temperton. Come on, tell me who he wrote for. I love the fact he was... Uh, Rod Temperton actually came from a town 20 minutes away from me, up that direction. That's where he came from, Cleethorpes. Which is really, yeah, Michael Jackson, yeah, so it is Rob Rod Tepper. So he wrote most of Michael Jackson's song, right, thriller, stuff like that. And uh, and I say I love it, the fact he came from twenty minutes away from where I live, which is super cool. And uh, not only that is the fact we have Robert Wyatt living in my my hometown, which is super cool. And and also uh, Elton John's songwriter I think was from around here as well, because uh, the the song Saturday Nights Are Right for Fighting is written about a town, again, about twenty minutes from here, which is cool. Anyway. Can I do a lesson on Jimmy Hendrix with your child? Tangent! Sadly not. I can try and do one for Instagram at some point, uh, but I don't know if it'll get blocked because they're starting to block on Instagram now. They're blocking on Facebook as well. Uh, I did a live stream on Facebook about a week or so ago playing Chili Pepper songs, and I got through the entire live stream. It was about an hour and a half live stream of playing Chili Pepper songs to backing tracks. And at the end of it, the video said, we're not going to publish this video because it's got copyright material for Warner Brothers and it's blocked. And I just had to delete it. And I was just like, they're blocking on Facebook, they're blocking on Instagram, they're blocking on YouTube. Old music has no chance. Maybe that's what they want. Maybe that's what music businesses want. They don't want you to listen to old stuff. They want you to listen to new stuff. I don't know. I don't know. Because you already have that CD. We want you to buy this CD. But maybe if I can get one done for, for, for Instagram, maybe at some point, if I get time to. I mean, teaching videos take a long time to do. That's the only thing about them. That's why I haven't done any recently. I just haven't had time. But I do have one. I do have ones planned. So uh, watch this space. So I'm going to have to move on to question three because I'm going to run out of time. So question three is, do you use any amp slash cab sims on your Zoom pedals? Or is it just delays and reverbs? Because wouldn't the amp sims not mix very well with the actual amp? Uh... No, I mean, I, I, I use, I have used cab, I, I, I don't use cab sims, I use amp sims on my Zoom. My Zoom G2 always has, uh, I don't remember what it is, I think I spoke about it in the, the Zoom video, I don't remember what I've, what I've said and what I haven't now, but it has a clean thing in it, I forget which one it is now, um, I don't have a manual here, do I? No, I don't. Burger bars. Um, yeah, when I run the Zoom, I have I have a compressor on, but it's it's weird. I run it in a weird way in the fact of 
uh, as you kind of go in, technically the compressor's volume is up, but the compression's all the way off. And I did that to just get a louder clean signal. Uh, it's, it's much in the same way as, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to question four in a minute. It comes along with that. But um, I use a compressor in the zoom pedal. But like I say, what it is, is compression's all the way off and volume's up. Not all the way, it's at 80. And it's on a fast mode, so it's really quick. Uh, and I, I have that on there, which I really, really like. I always have chorus on. I think I spoke about this in the last video as well. Chorus is always on, although everything's turned down to zero. Um, and I have, I do have an amp model on, but I can't remember for the life of me what it is. Um, no, I don't remember what it is. I do have an amp model on, but I always find it just enhances and it gives you more tone option. But the thing about the amp model again is I have the tone all the way off and the gain all the way up. And again, the idea was that is I just want to push the amp a bit harder in the front end. Uh, and I have volume quite high as well. I have volume about 70, 80 odd. But I forget what the actual amp model I've got on the Zoom G2 is. Uh, on the Zoom G5N, I have the Marshall Plexi, the 1959, the MS 1959. Because I just find it, because I like to run amps clean. I don't like to get my sound from an amp. I like to, I like the amp to run clean uh, because I like to be able to kind of have my sound in a pedal. That way, no matter what amp I plug into, as long as it gives me a really good clean thing, which all amps do, uh, regardless of what they are, you, I'll get my sound. You know what I mean? Steve Vai, you know, does the same thing. Quite a lot of, I think, guys do the same thing. Um, I don't like to rely on, on, on an amp for my sound because if you are solely reliant on, like, say, oh, I need a Marshall JSM 800, otherwise I just can't get my sound. And you do a gig one day where there's a Mesa Boogie triple rectifier or it's a Fender Twin, you know, or a, a silver face Fender Twin that just has no break up, a, roll, a Roland Jazz Chorus, which has happened before as well. You turn up and you're reliant on an amp for your distortion tone and you've got like nothing, you're in trouble. And I don't like the idea of that. I like to have all my sounds in one thing and go, right, I've got everything here. So all I need is an amp that gives me a clean bass tone and I can shove everything over the top of it and away I go. Um, so I and the amp sims, uh, well, yeah, the amp sims in the Zoom, I thought have always kind of helped enhance that as well. And I've always found they're, they're the great leveler. Uh, I kind of mimicked it in my Line 6 HX uh, in using a overdrive pedal. The Stupor overdrive pedal is on all the time in the Line 6 HX. And that's basically my bass tone. You know what I mean? Like I can plug my HX into any amp ever made. And because no matter what happens is that stupor overdrive sits and everything else sits on top of it. You know what I mean? It's the, it's the foundation of my sound. Uh, same with my jackhammer and my golden plexi and the Marshall 1959 um, thing in the Zoom G5, which I want to talk about at the end of this vid. Uh, and and stuff like, you know, even the Helix, I did the same thing. I put the Stupor Overdrive in there with a 10 bandy graphic EQ as as the foundation, basically. So, um, so yeah. So, yeah, I do do it. And I personally feel it enhances things. Like, it enhances your pedal board. And it makes things run a bit more kind of like um, consistently and, and, and more kind of homogenous, if you will. So, so yeah, and, and they don't affect the amps. No, I've always found Zoom's little amp modules to be so good. So, uh, I, I've, I've always loved them. I say I love Zoom. I, I will always love Zoom. I really will. Um, like I said, I have my first two Zoom pedals ever. One's here. Uh, this is my first ever Zoom pedal. It's the Zoom 606. Did anyone else have one of these? This was... I, I used this for about three years. So that's my first ever Zoom. And I've got the uh, I've got Fender and Gibson uh, logo, Sellotape to the paddles. And then I've got this one. This is my first G2, uh, which is in retirement now because it's very bad and beaten. So this is my first G Zoom G2. But like I say, and then I've got three of these now. I use two of them. And then I've got the Zoom G5N now. But um, but like I say, I mean, these I just, I just love them in all fairness. I think they're brilliant. This is my first foray into kind of uh, Zoom pedals. This is when I realized that I was never not going to have like a multi-effects unit. Uh, and like I say, I just love this pedal. Dave's just in case just in case anybody need to remind him but uh, I, I need to do more of a demo with this don't I 
Shall we do a video with this, people of a tube? Because it still works. The inputs are dodgy, but they still work if you kind of like, you kind of have to jiggle them around. This is still set up as well, like I had it way back. Uh, I haven't used this. I did a video with this years ago, but I haven't used this properly like for ages and it's still set up the way I had it set up then. So uh, we'll have to do a video with this people too. What do you, what, what say you? It's really cool. Like I said, I used that till 2005. I, I got that in 2003 and I used it to 2005. Then I used this one, this Zoom G5. I used this live uh, until 2017. 2005 to 2017, this pedal was always there. No ifs, no buts. And it, it shows it as well. It's absolutely filthy. It doesn't really work anymore. It still works, but barely. Um, you know, but it does still work. You know what I mean? If if I had to go to a gig of this, it still functioned the way I needed it to function. So uh, it's just the foot switches are a bit dodgy and the, the store button is gone. It's just broken. It's gone. It just fell out one day. Uh, the effect type, I can't change effects type. What it's programmed in at is what it stays at now. But um, but yeah, so uh, but I, I say I love the amp models. I don't use the extra EQ cab mic thing. That's just on zero. But um, but a drive, yeah, I do use a drive thing in there. But it's again just to push the front end of the amp. So so yeah, uh, I hope that made sense. Um, okay, so but I just like I just like it. But like I say, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to revisit Mister Six Oh Six. So many people I know had one of these. When I when I was first started playing guitar, like so many people I know had this, and they all broke. Everyone's broke because because it's plastic. It's it's not metal. Um, they are a bit fragile, but this one lives, man. And it's because uh, I love it and I, I really look after it and I I still look after it. And like I say, it, it spends most of its time in it's in retirement along with my first G two. Um, but yeah. So anyway, uh, moving along. But yeah, that's that's the reason I do that, and I'd say I just find things, certain things enhance the amps more. And like I say, I like my sound to come from pedals, not from the amp. Uh, I, although I do like to plug straight into an amp, it's nice, especially when you have a nice amp. But I would prefer my sound to come from pedals, and the amp just be there for power. So uh, that way you're never disappointed, uh, tonally, which is great. Okay, so I hope this question. Move on to final question today. Question four. Question four is, what are your thoughts on Andy Timmons and how would you achieve his tone? Would it be through an amp or would it be through pedals? I love Andy Timmons. He is, somebody introduced me to him a couple of years ago and said, oh, listen to this. And it was Electric Gypsy. And I was just like, I fell in love. And I was like, Andy, you're a god. And he's one of my favorite guitar players. And he was supposed to be coming to the UK this year to tour and I was going to go and see him. But then this happened. Cheers. Uh depressing uh because i really want to see him live I, I, it'd be it'd be so cool he's such an amazing player so um i love it he's it just he's playing he's just so expressive and he's just so good he's just sickeningly sickeningly good andy timmons is it's like anything you want him to do he can do it if you want him to shred he can do it if you want him to play jazz he can do it if you want to play him really quiet and tastefully and bluesy he can do it if you want to play really melodically and sad he can do it He's just he's just one he's one of those perfect all round guitarists and his tone is to die for. Uh, he's just he's just a, he's just wicked. He's wicked. How would I achieve his tone? I would get his tone through pedals, which is pretty much what he does, kind of. Uh, for the longest time, he used because uh, he's a Mesa Boogie Lone Star guy. For the longest time, and before that, he used like stiletto. The stiletto, excuse me. He uh, would use kind of like. Um, like the amps kind of clean tone and the distortion tone for his kind of like lead tone but then he had a he had the, he had the at pedal made for him by uh, i think it was jhs who makes it isn't it uh when he had the j the the at pedal his signature drive pedal kind of made for him he he, he, he just ran his amp clean and just used that because he said he finds it he found that I, mean, I don't know if he still does it but the last thing i heard he was using just the at uh, because he said he, he likes it because it's more consistent than the amp, you know what I mean? And also, it doesn't matter where he is. Uh, I remember him talk, telling a story that he went to see Eric Johnson play one night and Eric invited him up onto stage. And, um, well, he, he spoke to him before the gig and said, oh, do you want to get up and play a song? And Andy was like, yes, and because why wouldn't you? Next to Eric Johnson. Um, and Andy said he, he, got to, he had to plug into a Fender amp 
but luckily he had the AT pedal and he said it didn't matter what I plugged into that night he says because I had my pedal and I had my sound and that's like that's that's the reason why I get all my sound from pedals because you're never without it you're never without your sound if you have your pedal board and it sounds like you doesn't matter what you plug into you know because I can imagine it was probably like a Fender Twin um, knowing Eric Johnson uh, so yeah so I would achieve his sound through pedals I would probably kind of like get something like a Boss Blues Driver which is what he uses uh, I mean the AT pedal you just get that and you've, you've got Andy Timmons' lead sound so if you've got like a Boss Blues Driver and the JHS uh, uh, AT pedal and a chorus pedal uh, and a delay or well, two delay pedals you'd need two delay pedals to get the Andy thing because Andy has a kind of like a I forget what it is. it is. I think one's a dotted eighth and one's a dotted sixteenth, but he runs two delays. Uh, I don't think he ever runs reverb. I think it's just two delays running, and he gives you this kind of kind of sound. So you need like if you got like a chorus pedal, two delay pedals, the AT pedal, and a Boss Blues driver, and a wah, I suppose, because Andy does use a wah very rarely, but he does. You've got Andy Timmons. You know what I mean? Um, it's very very you know, and then it's just a case of dialing it in and like you know as, again again what i would do is i would just kind of like go for like super, super i would just have the amp super super clean oh compressor as well compressor is really again is really key to andy's sound because andy uses a uh i forget the brand of compressor andy uses but the way he runs it is the way i run my compressor in the zoom and always have done it with the fact that the compression's all the way down but the volume's cranked so you're not getting really any compression it's just pushing the front end of the amp more to give you a, a cleaner sound and there's a lot of videos on andy talking about that and, and how it uh, changes his sound and i've done that always with the zoom i mean I, did, I discovered that very early on with this thing that like you know if you put the compressor on turn the compression off and turn the level up you get a really kind of pushed clean tone which is really nice and uh it just controls everything as well you know what i mean it just levels things out so, yeah, you need a compressor in there as well. I mean, in all fairness, I think you could get other pedals that would do the Andy thing. You wouldn't have to get the AT. You could probably get, like, budget pedals. I bet any money, something like, uh, you know, the Boss DS2 does it. I mean, that's what I use if I play Andy Timmons songs. Uh, I use the Boss DS2 for his lead tone. Um, but there are many pedals out there you could do. That, that. But I, I would say the Boss Blues Driver would probably be, like, the most important because, you know, it's a nice, you know, not cheap, but cheapish compared to the other pedals. And again, you know, it's just that single coily thing that Andy's got with it, even though they're not single coils, like the DiMaggio Cruisers, but they still have that single coil snap. But we're just, you know, noise cancelling. Uh, I really want to try some DiMaggio Cruisers because of Andy. <laughs> In all fairness, I'd love to try his signature guitar, but it's way out of my price range. Anyway, but how would I achieve his tone through pedal uh, amps or pedals? I would go pedals. I wouldn't go for an amp. I wouldn't go out and buy a, a Lone Star, a Mess Boogie Lone Star, or anything like that. I would just go and I would just go and buy pedals that kind of emulate his sound, you know. Uh, and if you can afford to get stuff like the AT pedal, the JHS AT pedal, and like you know, um, Carl Martin compressor. Uh, and stuff like that then go for it but if you can't there are other pedals out there will, that will do the same kind of thing you know what i mean so but andy has really free sounds he's got the compressed clean tone which you can hear on stuff like um like gone i think it is i think it's called gone it's just these really sad melodic things he has that kind of pushed kind of cleanish tone which is really kind of like sparkly and glassy then he has the electric gypsy cleanish tone, which is the Boss Blues driver, which is a really distorted tone, but he rolls the volume down with a treble bleed to get a um, a broken up cleanish kind of Jimi Hendrixy kind of tone. Then he has his, has his lead tone, and in all fairness, that's the same thing as Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson has clean rhythm and lead, and uh, you know, there's a lot of Eric Johnson in Andy's playing. You can hear it. You know, you can hear there's an influence in there definitely, especially in his lead tone of how dark it is. You know, and some of the chord voicings that Andy uses are, are straight out of the book of Eric Johnson. You know what I mean? So, um, which is cool. Again, showing your influences. You know what I mean? It's so cool. I love that. I love when you can hear people's influences. You know, you can always you can always hear Eric Johnson in Joe Bonamassa, and you can hear Danny Gatton in there as well. And and you know, in, in Peter Green, you could hear BB King and and Buddy Guy, and in Jimi Hendrix, you could hear those guys as well. And 
in John Vashanti you can hear Jimi Hendrix and you can also hear Robert Fripp and you can hear all these other guys you can hear Bernard Sumner and so cool so cool I love listening to um, listening for influences in other guitarists it's so cool so how would I choose to yeah definitely pedals definitely pedals because it, you're never going to be disappointed then and it doesn't matter what amp you've got you know because you can be able to dial those pedals in to that and get that sound and so no matter where you go you've got that thing but Andy is such a wicked player I love him I'm going to go and listen to him after this actually I need to go and listen to Andy play um, so cool so yeah um, there we go everybody um, yeah I uh, hope you enjoyed this Q&A Wednesday video I hope it's been informative I hope answer questions okay as best I can anyway I'm sorry about question one um, but yeah I hope there's something in there uh, I want to let you know that if this channel reaches 80,000 subscribers, I'm giving away my Zoom G5 as it is programmed. Uh, I'm going to give it away. Uh, as much as I love it, I want to give it away. I feel like I, I want to give it to somebody. I don't know why. But, uh, you know, paddles thing aside, I don't know. But I'm going to give that away. At eight, uh, if this channel gets to 80,000 subscribers, I'm going to give that away. And obviously, we've got the 100,000 subscribers guitar to give away if I get if I make it to 100,000. But um, when I reach 80, I'm going to give away the Zoom. We'll do a, I'll do a little competition thing. I'm going to give away the Zoom G5N um, as it is. So, uh, yeah. Um, uh, like I said, I'm not going to factory set it. I'm just going to leave it programmed the way I've got it set because I won't be messing with... Now, Now I when I did that video the other day of kind of dialing it in as close as I could to my pedal board, that's the way it stays. I will be doing more videos with it. I want to do kind of more sounds. I want to get Peter Green sound, Rory Gallagher sound, Jimi Hendrix sound and a few others out of it. And they'll be in there as well when I give it away uh, as well as kind of my presets and stuff like that. So when I reach 80,000, I'm going to give that pedal away. Uh, if you want to submit a question for Q&A Wednesday, uh, description box below has an email link. Forward me an email there. And uh, yeah, other than that, have a great morning, afternoon, and a good evening. And I'll see you again Friday for another vid. Uh, I have some really interesting strings to try out on Friday, everybody. I think it should make for quite an interestingly giggly video. So uh, I'll see you on Friday for a string vid, which I don't do. I, I don't really do string vids often, but I think this one could be fun. So I'm not going to say too much more at this point in time because I'm going to wait until then, but... I'll see you then. Until then, have a great morning, afternoon, good evening. Already said that. Already say it twice for luck. And uh, yeah, um, goodbye now. Uh, thank you for watching.